Janet Yellen isn't dovish enough, and there's cracks in Mount Gox. You're in the right place, folks, because this is where the money is. Welcome to the show. It is Tuesday. I'm Matt Copenheffer. This is David Hansen. And David, right after I tell you this, I'm betting you're going to jump in your car to drive down to Atlantic City. Drive up? It is up. Oh, I, it's up. I, I, grew up in, I grew up in northern New Jersey, so I think of Atlantic City as down all the time. It, 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 but regardless of where you are, you're always going down <laughs> when true. you're going to Atlantic City. Let's Very true. It. But at the Tropicana Casino this week, there's a bacon festival mm. with all sorts of bacon-infused foods. Where is that sound? Oh, gosh. Boom. What is the one bacon-infused food that you would not want to eat? Anything in a drink. I do not get these bacon drinks. It's ridiculous. You're not going with the bacon martini? Nobody bacon wants a salty tini? drink. I'll go, I'll go drink the ocean water in Atlantic <laughs> City if I want a salty drink. I don't want the martini with bacon in it. Keep it away. Fair enough. All right. I'm going with nothing since I'm a vegetarian. Exactly. I know. I didn't even <laughs> nothing, need to ask. Nothing with bacon. All right. First headline of the day. We've got a little Janet Yellen. The headline is, Janet Yellen fails to deliver dovish surprise, all caps. That's from business Insider, Janet Yellen released, or the Federal Reserve, I should say, released her statement. She's going to go testify in front of Congress this morning. Or maybe she is already? What time did that start? I think start? it's 10 o'clock. It okay. started, yes. Yeah, going on right now. Going on right now. Uh, David, markets are going to crash because she wasn't dovish enough. What are we going to do? It says dovish, dovish surprise, but didn't everyone say she was a big dove? So why would that be a surprise if she was dovish? So I don't know. Uh, it's a surprise that she didn't have a dovish surprise. I'm not reading too much into her comments today. It'll be, it'll be more interesting just to see kind of what her demeanor is on the Hill today. As I've said before, I don't put too much weight in my investing decisions in what the Fed's doing. But I haven't heard that a, before. It's still a, a monumental moment for, for her as Fed chair. So I'll be tuning in just to see kind of what it was like. What are you watching? <laughs> <laughs> there, like you said, there was nothing surprising about this statement. She was on the committee that was setting monetary policy already. She was in agreement with what the committee was doing. She was chums with Ben Bernanke, we mm -hmm. might say. I don't know if they actually hung out and had beers together or anything like that. But anyway, it's, she, it sounds like she wants to continue the, the taper mm -hmm. as long as economic activity uh, continues uh, on pace. I mean, we've been worried about some, some bad jobs numbers lately, a, a few economic indicators that haven't held up just recently. But when you look at the second half of 2013 in terms of uh, economic growth, it's starting to look good. The housing market continues to recover. Broadly, the, the, the job market uh, is continuing to recover. Uh, so she's looking to continue that tapering, continue to reduce the amount of bonds that the Fed is buying. This isn't like a big reversal right. here. It's just buy fewer bonds, a fewer billions of dollars worth of bonds. Also, she reiterated that with inflation trending below the Fed's target of 2%, uh, she's thinking that it will, and, and this isn't new, uh, it, it'll be necessary to keep the, the federal funds rate at or near zero for well beyond 6.5% unemployment on the course to getting to full employment. Uh, why not? As, yeah. long as, you, as long as you can maintain pricing stability, which mm -hmm. is a, a key goal of the Fed, go for it. We saw another headline out there. I'm not going to call anyone out, but it said Tuesday trade based on Yellen. Just, just stop. The Tuesday trade is not, okay. We'll move on to the next headline. Moving Tuesday over to Tuesday trade. A headline. This is from uh, this is from the Bitcoin Foundation. It says contrary to Mount Gox's statement, Bitcoin is not at fault. We bre we touched on this briefly yesterday in the the tweet it segment that Mount Gox was having some issues. They weren't allowing withdrawals from their system, and now all the other exchanges and the Bitcoin Foundation itself is saying, hey, this is not a Bitcoin problem as Mount Gox said it was. This is a Mount Gox problem and. Apparently, I'm not a computer engineer here, apparently when these exchanges are developing their own wallet systems, they have to work with the protocol of Bitcoin and what, uh, with what the protocol was. So all the other exchanges were coming out and saying, hey, this isn't a problem with us, don't freak out. Don't look at the Mount Gox price. That's not a good representation of what prices are right now. Look to a, a, a blockchain, a Coinbase. That's more representative. Of what's yeah, going it on. sounds like you're a company man for Bitcoin right now <laughs> because the Bitcoin Foundation, I, I think they're talking their book a little bit. And to, to be fair, 
it, it, do, it, it does sound like it's something that's isolated to Mt. Gox from the perspective that Mt. Gox isn't uh, working with a known Bitcoin glitch in the right way. It's this idea of transaction malleability. Of course. Or, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, for simplicity's sake, it's this idea that there is a small window after a transaction takes place, that the, the idea of that transaction can be changed before it's recorded to the blockchain. And the blockchain is where it's stored for all of eternity within mm -hmm. Bitcoin. Um, so it's been known for a while that this transaction malleability existed. And the reason that other exchanges aren't having problems with this is because they built their software around dealing with this. Right. Apparently, Mt. Gox, not so much. So Bitcoin Foundation is coming out, not necessarily saying, there's nothing wrong with Bitcoin. It's just, just that they didn't. There is act something wrong with Bitcoin, but they're not handling it correctly. What's interesting uh, when it comes to the problems that Mt. Gox has been having in this transaction malleability thing is one thing that it potentially allows people to do is double pay. Mm -hmm. And what the concern is, is that some of Mt. Gox's users were taking Mt. Gox for a ride and uh, a doubling up on the amount that they were withdrawing. And that's why Mt. Gox's uh, response has been to gate withdrawals exactly. from the system. So uh, a little bit of Bitcoin intrigue there. Of course. Third headline of the day, we're going to the housing market. This is Wells Fargo and their economics group's uh, housing chart book. So we've seen some, some, again, we've seen some recent economic numbers that haven't looked so great. We've seen some recent housing numbers that have been less than what we have been seeing in the past few years, mm -hmm. past recent quarters. Wells Fargo not concerned. Wells Fargo continues to believe that the housing market will continue to recover in sort of this choppy fashion. Mm -hmm. At least that's what I got from this report. Right. Uh, I don't think they were overly optimistic. I think they're being realistic and they are some economists every, every, out there. They're, everybody wants to be realistic. They're looking, at the, they're about they're looking at the data and their main takeaway is saying we're being unrealistically optimistic here. That's, that's very <laughs> true. Um, their main takeaways were that the housing market's still going to move forward. All the fundamentals of kind of supply and demand are there for the, for the housing market to continue to appreciate in value over the next year, but maybe not at the rate that we have been seeing it double digit gains year over year. They project for the year going forward, four and a half percent. You mean if I start flipping Las Vegas homes, I'm not gonna get rich automatically? Maybe, maybe in some areas, again, this is just their median home price, four and a half percent move up in the next year. And they say, the reason it's slower is investors are stepping away, the Blackstones of the world, the single family REITs are stepping back a little bit from the market. Rates have gone up a little bit since the last couple of years. Uh, and more construction starting, more supply is coming into the market. So that's gonna temper prices in uh, kind of the short run. So just to build on what you were saying, again, Blackstone was in there buying single family homes. You had uh, the uh, now a separate, separate entity, uh, Silver Bay, mm -hmm. which was part of Two Harbors as Two Harbors was buying up single family homes. They spun that out into a mm -hmm. set. So you've got these investors that came in and were buying all of these homes, but now we're going to need to see a, uh, a change of the guard and, and regular, we'll call it regular mm -hmm. buyers or, or actually homeowners coming back in to purchase these. One trend that Wells Fargo is looking at that will help push this along is that the rental market has been so robust, has been so hot, that rental uh, rates are going yep. up and it makes com uh, ho housing look comparatively cheaper to buy. However, one of, the, one of my takeaways from looking at some of the charts that Wells Fargo had there is even today, following the, the housing downturn, house, uh, homes in the U.S. don't look especially affordable. Mm. They don't... A lot of a lot of a lot of the charts that, that they showed, uh, housing construction down. You've got the the inventory way down, but the affordability doesn't look like it's drastically down. Like this is a no-brainer that that everybody should be owning a home. Right, and uh, one of the reasons I mean you can point to is that incomes haven't been necessarily moving up a ton, so the affordability... And by necessarily, we just mean not. Not. <laughs> um, one thing they did point out was that interest rates, a lot of people say, well, rates are up, that's going to make housing a lot less affordable, and that's going to kill demand for homes. They said that's not necessarily true. That's mostly true with first-time home buyers, which are a very small portion of the overall home buying segment. So even though that mortgage rates are up over the last year or so, that doesn't really impact it that much. Okay, moving on to the, earn uh, the earnings for today. Moving on to the focus for today is earnings. Mm -hmm. uh, we, earnings reports continuing to, to come in. Actually, it's slowing down a little bit for us. 
a lot of the banks are towards the, the front end of earnings season. We've seen a lot of the insurance companies already. So it's just, it's getting a little bit more sporadic for our sector. However, yesterday after the close, one of the show's favorites, Markel, reported fourth quarter and full year earnings. What was your takeaway from Markel's report? We, we, we haven't had the chance to listen to uh, Tom Gaynor speak right. on the conference call that's going on right now. Going on right now. Uh, maybe we'll bring some more color from that tomorrow. But, uh, but what was your, uh, from the press release, what was your takeaway? I thought it was an impressive year. I mean, you look at book value growth, which is what you want to look at with a company like Markel, up, what, 18%? And that's on a per, sh per share basis. On a per share basis. So they which did, is important because right, of the shares. Right, big issue. acquisition. Um, so 18%, that's pretty substantial for a company that's trading at, I don't know, what, 1.3 times book value? It's not a crazy price for a company growing book value at 18% year over year. But a big reason for that was the insurance business looked really good in 2013 because there weren't a lot of catastrophes out there. And we've seen that. That's a theme that we've seen in other insurance companies. They said 20, 2012 was not a great year. We had Hurricane Sandy. We had a bunch of catastrophes. This year, it was pretty quiet. So that, that was a boost to the results this year. I, that was my number one takeaway, too, is that 18% year over year uh, per share book value growth. That's huge. I continue to think that Markel is a value here. Uh, and they were able to, to, to do that despite rising interest rates, mm -hmm. which hurt fixed income portfolios. Markel does have a very large fixed income portfolio. Of course, that is buoyed a little bit by, or offset, we'll say a little bit, by uh, a larger than average equity stock portfolio. Mm -hmm. And obviously 2013 was a very good year for stocks. Um, so, so that helped out. Uh, one of the things I'll point out from the insurance side, or a couple of things I'll point out on the insurance side, it sounds like pricing was still pretty good for them, uh, almost across the board on the primary insurance side. So that's where they're directly writing the insurance policies. Uh, they've continued to have the ability to raise prices. They said a little bit of softening on the primary, some primary catastrophe lines. Uh, and then reinsurance, they also talked about prices softening a little bit there. That's not too surprising. Love to see a turnaround in the, the reinsurance business, but there's a lot of capital in there, and some of that's going to have to come out before we see that. The other thing is that among the underwriting results, the underwriting results broadly looked really good, mm -hmm. except when you look at that Altera segment, right. Altera reporting, or Markel reporting for Altera, a 118% combined ratio. Of course, the combined ratio, as we've gone through on this show, that basically tells you underwriting profitability, 100% being that demarcation between yep. prof, uh, profitable below 100%, unprofitable above. So 118%, that looks horrible until you consider that nine points of that was due to transaction costs uh, for, for the acquisition. Right. And then a lot of the rest of it, as Markel put it, was impacted by applying our more conservative loss reserving philosophy. Markel very, very conservative in its underwriting, bringing that to Altera and not afraid to take a hit up front mm -hmm. to make sure that they're doing the right thing long term in that business. Love that about Markel. Always. What other earnings are you looking at? Uh, we mentioned CYS, the mortgage REIT uh, that they were reporting. Not a ton to report here. It was pretty similar picture to what we saw at American Capital Agency. They brought leverage down a little bit, moved into 15-year assets, uh, now trading with the updated book value at 8 to 10 percent discount. So not as huge, but the market's still saying, we're not going to trade you at even to, to what your book value is here quite yet. So still trading at a discount. Uh, the dividend right kind of borderline may see some more cuts from that coming in the, in the coming quarters here. Um, maybe, maybe not. Uh, it, it's right on the edge there. Speaking of American Capital Agency in terms of them buying other mortgage REITs, I mentioned on the show yesterday. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. So we got, uh, we did find out one of them that they've been buying. Uh, American Capital Agency and kind of their parent company were out and buying Hatteras the mortgage REIT that invests in mostly uh, adjustable rate mortgage-backed securities. Uh, so now they own about 8% of Hatteras. So went out and bought a big stake of Hatteras. Sh just thought I'd update everyone on kind of where they were putting <laughs> their money. It's an interesting approach. So that is where uh, AG&C was putting their money. Okay, uh, an earnings report that actually happened last week, but we were out of the office, so we didn't get a chance to cover it. Bank of, uh, Bank of Internet, mm -hmm. this is uh, a Fan favorite, we could say. Uh, high growth bank does its business over the internet, as the name suggests. Uh, this is, I, I forget what fiscal quarter it is for them, but they're not on a December uh, December year end. 
But another quarter of stellar growth for, for Bank of Internet. This is what we've come to expect from the company. Continues to grow its asset base, continues to grow its uh, loan book, continues to grow uh, net income. I think net income was up 30% year over year, which is quite impressive for a bank. Net interest margin was just a hair above 4%, wow. which is extremely impressive. Um, so you've got a lot going for this bank there. Uh, the efficiency ratio, which is basically how much of the revenue is eaten up by costs, so the lower the better. Mm -hmm. Efficiency ratio back under 40%. That's stellar for a bank. That's, that's an excellent ratio. So a lot of that's because they don't have the bricks and mortar operation there. Uh, but I continue, to, because, largely because or partly because Bank of the Internet trades at such a high valuation multiple, uh, my, my concerns are up about certain things about the bank. Uh, lo the loan to deposit ratio is well above 100%. Mm -hmm. uh, this bank is levered, if you look at assets versus uh, shareholders equity, levered higher than most other banks right now. And, uh, and those increase the risk. So, so if everything continues to go right, that can be fine for the bank. Uh, if things don't go right, Ha having that kind of leverage in the business at this point in the cycle, I don't know, may maybe maybe a little something to, to keep an eye on. Also, the, the rate spread, that net interest margin, I, I, I don't know where that comes from. And, and maybe there's something easy that I'm missing here. But one of the things that, that uh, Bank of Internet points out is that it's got very good loan quality. It's, it's primarily lending at uh, loan to value ratios below 60%. Mm -hmm. A lot of its loans are below 60%. That's very safe. Uh, their metrics look really good. Their non-performing loans, their charge-offs. And so you'd think that they'd be lending, lending to safer right. uh, borrowers, lending at low LTV ratios. You'd think they'd be getting lower rates on their loans, but they're not. And they're getting this, they're getting this big spread here. Not sure yet where that's coming from, but it's something that I'm looking into. Let's put it out to the listeners. If anybody yeah, watch, yeah. if anybody follows B of I closely, let Matt know what's going on in that loan portfolio. Exactly. Any others you wanted to cover before we move on? Uh, no, let's move on. All right, going to the mailbag. We have an email address. That email address is wtmi at fool.com. We love getting questions and comments. And today's question comes from Patrick in Phoenix. And Patrick writes, Hey guys, I was struck by something David said during today's podcast about patience in timing a stock purchase until the valuation is favorable. Given the constant competition from professionals and entire industries, I'm not sure if that time exists. This led me to question the use of dollar cost averaging in my non-401k account. I'm 30 and have made some steady retirement contributions during my grad school and early employment years. I recently switched jobs and company match won't kick in until next year, so I'm going to focus on quality growth stocks for the time being. I had planned to pull my monthly allocation towards a few stocks recommended by The Fool and purchase whichever one of a dozen quality stocks had a recent pullback or little movement. Are you suggesting I wait to do so quarterly or semi-annually? Perhaps you could offer some clarification on the timing of stock purchases. David? I should offer some clarification. You should. Enlighten us. Okay, so if you're looking at recommendations from Motley Fool Services uh, that you subscribe to here that are formal recommendations, those stock picks have been vetted by our teams downstairs, our analysts downstairs, so they are giving you those recommendations saying, now is the right time to be purchasing this stock. You don't need to wait for a lower price. Mm -hmm. We've done the research, we've done the valuation work, so you don't need to do that. What I was referring to and what I should have been even more clear Even better, on. sorry, because I'm a company man, I'm also gonna point this out. Within the Motley Fool services, they also have lists of stocks that they say are best buys now. Right. So you can always tune into that list and that's a best buy now. Right, so I should have been more clear. I was referring to someone that's more of a, of a do-it-yourself completely, maybe not using Motley Fool formalized stock picks and going out on their own and looking for stocks. I was referring to more to that you find a great company, great management, awesome fundamentals, but the price isn't right. And mm -hmm. the ability to be patient and not jump at that just because it's such a good business, but to stick to your own valuation process. And if it doesn't fit your valuation needs and your valuation process, then the ability to wait on that. So if you have formalized stock picks, I would say you don't need to change your, your process there. I think that's a fine process to follow our stock picks. I, I follow many of the Molly Fool stock picks myself, um, and I don't necessarily have to go Favorite, favorite newsletter? I'm gonna go with Inside Value. Yeah. What about you? 
Uh, Inside Value and Stock Advisor are my two favorites. So, so yeah, I should have been more clear there. I was more referring to going out on your own. Do you have any clarification on my own words? Yeah, no, I, I, I think I think you nailed it there. And uh, an example from from my own uh, investing history is with Berkshire Hathaway. Prior to the financial crisis, uh, who doesn't know how, how how talented and good of an investor? Warren Buffett is, and, and obviously you want to be investing mm -hmm. uh, alongside Warren Buffett, but prior to the financial crisis, I looked at the valuation for Berkshire Hathaway, and I just it just didn't work for me. Uh, the, the returns, the return uh, calculation just didn't seem right. So I waited, and I talked a lot about how great Berkshire's business was. I, I was a writer for The Fool, so I would write about how great Berkshire's business was. I'd write about how smart Buffett was, but it just wasn't, to me, it just wasn't mm -hmm. the time to buy it. Then the financial crisis came around, and the price of Berkshire stock got clubbed just along with everything else. And while other things did get comparatively cheaper versus Berkshire, Berkshire became a viable opportunity from a returns perspective. Mm -hmm. So that's the point at which I, I bought. So literally, I, I, I waited years watching the Berkshire business and, uh, and waiting for the right price to get in on that. Right. In terms of, I want to make sure, in terms of kind of overall index funds, I definitely don't think you should try to time that in terms of when to put all your money in index fund and when in, to take Index it all funds out. should be about. I would say that's dollar, dollar cost, cost yeah. averaging there. Um, so, yeah. Or timing, or timing the market. Mostly timing the market. <laughs> don't do timing the market. <laughs> all dollar cost averaging, but then mostly timing the market. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. Uh, game for today. We've got a little bit of would you rather, literally a little bit of would you rather. I think we have just one scenario today. One scenario. Let's get that up. David, would you rather own Netflix or Trulia? Netflix, of course, online and still through the mail, movies. Mm -hmm. Trulia is uh, it's a competitor to Zillow, right? right. And does uh, online real estate. So I'll throw out a couple stats on the, the Zillow versus Trulia before I go to the Netflix. Please, Trulia. please do, please. So Zillow is the leader in this space. They get more traffic, more agents come to their site, more eyeballs are on their site. So they deserve to have performed better. And they have performed better from a stock perspective and a business perspective. Uh, but the valuation is certainly realized in that. Zillow trades at 18 times sales. Trulia, the next biggest competitor, at nine times sales. So you're mm -hmm. getting it for basically half the valuation. Yes, you're not getting the same type of growth, but I think that's pretty impressive. Do you think I, that's a winner take all market? Maybe not winner take all, but winner take winner most. Take most. <laughs> winner take most, but I'm, I'm between Netflix and Trulia, I'm going to go with Trulia. Um, just because the valuation is cheaper than a Zillow, which I own, uh, but I still like the online real estate space. I think this can go so many different ways. And I know you can say the same thing about online video. That can go a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. But online real estate is still such, such a small market. The market cap of this is under $2 billion, And in a market opportunity that's billions, maybe a trillion dollars one day, uh, I like Trulia here. I, as a customer, I love Netflix. I love the idea of Netflix. I really like the idea that it's getting outside of, because one of the disappointments with Netflix, and this is as a customer, mm -hmm. is just when I go to look for, for movies on Netflix, there's not a whole lot there that I really want to watch. Um, I, I like that they're, they're getting into their own production. House of Cards is tremendous. Uh, Orange is the New Black was awesome, um, or is awesome. They're both still ongoing. Actually, House of Cards starting back up this Friday. Mm -hmm. um, but... It, there's a big challenge in that business uh, that comes from the acquisition costs. And I know that there are a lot of people concerned about it. And here uh, at The Fool, there are also a lot of people that aren't really concerned about it and very excited about the Netflix business going forward. I haven't dug into that enough to really know how big of a challenge uh, content acquisition is going to be for Netflix going forward mm -hmm. and how much the accounting for the content that they're acquiring now uh, is going to be an issue going forward. Right. It's a little confusing why yeah. they do that. On the other hand, I guess I'm with you. I'd, I'd, pr I'd rather own Zillow, which mm -hmm. I actually do own Zillow, but I think that there is a big, bright future for um, online real estate services. That is an industry, I think, ripe for disruption. Um, or maybe disruption is not the wrong word, but just gaining from mm -hmm. the capabilities of the internet. And Trulia is... Not as great as Zillow, right. but it's there. Right. I mean, you look at Some the ad dollars spent in the real estate business. 
a very, very small portion of it is going to online. Now you still have all the billboards Most of it's still on toilet seat covers. <laughs> exactly. Urinal pads. Urinal pads. Um, so <laughs> so the opportunity is there to move where the eyeballs are, and the eyeballs are increasingly online. All right. Uh, finishing off today in the Twitter sphere, David, what is our first tweet? First and only tweet. First and only. God. From one of our favorites, Crowd Turley says, the goal isn't to avoid risk. The goal is to be well compensated for manageable risk. And when I saw this tweet, I said, finally. That's what I want to hear. I think this hits it dead on. We hear someone say, that's a risky business. They do, they do student loans. They do credit card loans. That's mm -hmm. insane. Why would anyone ever do that? But as long as you're compensated for the risk, you're fine. I mean, you look at a company like Discover, they've catered to the lower end. They've given credit card loans to maybe not the wealthiest customers like an American Express, but they've done very well for themselves and their credit profile bears that. I mean, they have mm -hmm. an amazing credit profile in terms of the returns they're generating on that portfolio. So just because someone's in a risky business, don't write it off, whether it be subprime lending. So it sounds scary. It, sound, it sounds very scary, David. But as long as you're getting the compensation on the risk side, it's, it can be okay. As long as you know what you're doing. Is yes. that what you're trying to tell me? Yeah. Business, business leaders and business operators need to know what they're doing? That would be optimal, yeah. That's an interesting concept. All right, that's the show for today. Uh, you can get a special report from The Motley Fool, courtesy of the WTMI uh, show here. Email WTMI offer, one word, WTMI offer, at fool.com, and you'll get a report on Warren Buffett's greatest wisdom for free. Uh, I'm Matt Kopenheffer. This here is David Hansen, and we'll see you tomorrow. People on the show may have interest in the stocks they talk about, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against. Don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear.